morning, church family. I hope this finds you well. I hope you're doing well uh, on this Wednesday. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for being with us. Um, I know we all miss seeing each other uh, on Wednesdays, uh, but I'm very thankful that we can continue our midweek services in this format. We're going to continue going through the book of Romans. We're going to be in Romans chapter 4, verses 18 through 21. Romans chapter 4, verses 18 through 21. Just those three or four verses there, right in the middle uh, of Romans chapter 4. Um, we're going to go through the end of Romans chapter 4 next week, and then uh, we're going to spend um, the four weeks in August doing something a little bit uh, different. We're going to look at the book of Jonah together in August. Uh, so if you want to spend some time reading through the book of Jonah over the next few weeks, we will certainly enjoy that study. But today we're in Romans chapter 4, starting in verse 18 and going to verse 21. Let's read those together. Who, against hope, believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not of the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Let's pray together as we get into God's word. Father, we are thankful for the Bible in a world increasingly filled with sinking sand. We are thankful for a rock that we can stand on. And Lord, we're thankful that your word never changes. That Paul's message to this Roman church was as much your word 2,000 years ago as it is to us today. So Father, open our hearts that we might hear, change our lives, we ask through the message uh, of these verses. Father, we don't come uh, to your word to just be informed, but we come to be transformed. And Lord, we ask uh, by your mercy you would change us inside and out through the preaching of your word. Lord, we love you. We're so thankful for what you've done in our hearts and our lives. We're so thankful for your grace and for your mercy, which is new each morning. Lord, we pray that we would see you more clearly and love you more closely as a result of what we see this morning. Well, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I don't really have a life verse or a, or a theme verse, um, but early on in the year, I can't exactly remember the circumstances. I was reading Romans chapter 4, and these verses, uh, 18 through 21, stood out at me. Um, so I uh, called Miss Wendy Wright, uh, and Miss Wendy very kindly uh, in her... Um, Calligraphy wrote these verses out for me on a couple of pieces of paper. So I have these verses framed in the corner of my house where I do my devotions each morning and then hanging up in my office uh, as well. So I've, I like to think I've read Romans 4, 18 through 21 uh, multiple times each day this year. Remember in Romans chapter 4, Paul is defending and explaining his teaching. Paul's letters more or less divide absolutely into two. You have the doctrine part and then the application part. You have the first part of the letter which is uh, all about what God has done for us and then you have the second part of the letter which is all about what we therefore need to do as a response to what God has done. And that's why uh, Romans chapter 12 starts with the word therefore, right? Because Paul has, has finished 11 chapters of this absolutely extraordinary theology and doctrine and now in 12 through 16, he's telling us how to apply it. But the gospel just bubbles up out of Paul. He, he can't keep it in. So even though in, in Romans chapter 4 we are, strictly speaking, in the, in the doctrine section of the book of Romans, there's still some great application baked in to this. And it should be that way, right? Because for a Christian, we don't have a category marked belief and a category marked life that categories, those categories are all mixed in together. There should be no division between what we believe in our heart and how we live out our lives. Paul has turned in chapter 4 
to two great examples to prove his argument. Paul's argument is that Jew and Gentile were equally lost in their sin, but equally rescued by the grace of God. And then Paul turns to David, and Paul turns to Abraham to illustrate the point that all men are lost in sin, but all men can be saved through faith in Christ. One of the great thrills uh, of reading Paul's letters is seeing how his mind works under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And it was an absolute stroke of genius for Paul to turn to two Old Testament giants, two Hebrew giants, Abraham and David, to prove that all men are only saved through faith in Christ. The Roman church was a divided church. Scholars believe at this time there were maybe 200 Christians uh, in the church in Rome meeting in anywhere between half a dozen and ten different homes. Uh, the Roman church was originally filled with men and women who had been Jews and had come to faith in Christ. And then in AD 60, all the Jews are thrown out of Rome. Whether they're Jewish Christians or or Jewish Jews, all the Jews are thrown out of Rome because they refuse to worship the emperor. We think of the Roman persecution as as a religious persecution, but it was really more of a political persecution. You know, the Roman Empire really couldn't care less about what religion you had as long as you also worshiped the emperor. Right? And, and for most people, that wasn't a problem. What's the issue with adding one more god when you've got a dozen gods, a thousand gods to worship? But for Christians, it wasn't that simple. Christians refused to say that the emperor is Lord because they would say that Jesus is Lord. So the Jews were all expelled from Rome, and then they were all allowed back in a few years later. But you can imagine the tension that that would create in this church. You can imagine that while the Jewish Christians were gone, the the Roman church became much less Jewish. You can imagine when those Jewish Christians came back, those Roman Christians were a little bit suspect about letting them back in. It doesn't take much imagination to see the difficulties that this would pose. So one of Paul's great burdens in this letter is to say, listen, there's no division between Jew and Roman, no division between Jew and Greek, no division between Jew and non-Jew. Everybody is lost in sin. Everybody can be saved by Christ. Last week we answered the question that Romans 4 verse 8 posed. Romans 4 verse 8 says, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. So we asked, how can we get that blessing? This week we answer a different question. How should we live once we have had that blessing. How shall we live if we're saved by faith? How shall we live if we're saved by faith? Well, Abraham is the best Old Testament example of what life lived by faith in Christ looks like. Christian, you understand, don't you, that that your Christian faith isn't just your Christian faith. Your Christian faith is not a private Your Christian faith isn't something you just live out in this building. No, your Christian faith uh, infects and changes every aspect of your life. If Christianity is blue, then every area of your life must be becoming more and more blue. The secular idea that somehow it's okay to be a Christian as long as you keep it private betrays an absolutely fundamental misunderstanding of what the Christian faith is. But Abraham is a great example of how we're supposed to live by faith in Christ. Abraham's faith changed his whole life. I wonder how your faith changes your life on a daily basis. We see six examples here, six illustrations in these few verses of how Abraham's faith changed his life. First of all, we see at the start of verse 18 that Abraham, against hope, believed in hope. You see that slightly weird English construction there at the start of verse 18. Who, against hope, believed in hope. Right? Let's think about the difference between hope and faith. Hope is a desire for something. Faith is a confidence in something. 
when I lean on this podium, I have faith it's going to hold me up. I don't have hope it's going to hold me up, right? I'm confident that, that this podium is going to hold me up. That's faith. When I make a phone call or make a visit this afternoon, I hope that those people are going to be in. Hope is desire, whereas faith is confidence. Abraham hoped and desired what God had promised, even though there seemed little chance of it coming true from a human perspective. Abraham was an old man. His wife was an old woman. And God takes him outside and says, look at the stars and say, as many as the stars are, that's how many descendants you're going to have. And then time passes and passes and passes and Abraham and Sarah don't have kids. And then God comes to Abraham and says, this time next year, you'll have a child. Abraham believed in God's promise, even though, humanly speaking, there was no chance of it coming true. Abraham's desires were focused on what only God can do. Friends, as Christians, our desires must not be in what we can do and what we can achieve, but we must desire that which only God can achieve. Abraham kept on looking to God. He didn't look at himself. But he spent time with the God, believing and hoping and trusting in the God who rules through his promise. So Christian, if you want to live faithfully to the Lord Jesus today, then keep on hoping in him. Keep on desiring the things that only he can do in your life, in your marriage, in your family, in your community. Secondly, we're told that Abraham was not weak in faith. Verse 19, and being not weak in faith, we see that right at the beginning. This relates to the first point, right, doesn't it? God comes to Abraham and Sarah and says, this time next year you have a son. They're both decades beyond childbearing age. But Abraham is not weak in faith. He doesn't consider his own body, which was about 100 years old. He doesn't consider the deadness of Sarah's womb. He was not weak in faith. How was he not weak in faith? Because God's promises filled him with hope. Christian, we worship a God who rules by promise. He doesn't drive us with a whip, but he draws us to us, draws us to himself with his promises. And we should turn those promises into prayers. I was reading 2 Samuel chapter 7 yesterday. 2 Samuel chapter 7 God promises David a blessing, and then David prays for God's blessing. Right, just like that. God promises David, you won't lack a son to sit on your throne. God promises David, I'll build you a house. And David says, God, please build me a house. That's a great prayer, right? Find the promises of God in the Bible and turn those promises into prayers. What are some things that God has promised you. Well, God has promised that he'll be with you always, even to the end of the age. So when you drive to the doctor's office and you're worried, pray, God, you've promised to be with me, so please be with me. When you sit down at the kitchen table with a family member and you take a deep breath and you say, listen, we need to talk, you can pray, God, you've promised to be with me, so please be with me. When you're in the teeth of a battle against temptation and, and you just feel that temptation getting under your skin and into your blood, you can pray, God, you've promised to be with me, so please be with me. Turn God's promises into prayers. God has promised that his glory will fill the earth like the waters fill the ocean. God has promised that Jesus will win and the gospel will prevail. So Christians, in this time particularly, let's pray, God, you've promised that Jesus wins, so... Please, please let Jesus win. <clears throat> God, you've promised that the gospel will prevail, so please let the gospel prevail. Please send revival and start with us. Abraham hung on tight to God's promises, and because of that, his faith did not weaken. Can I tell you, friend, if your faith in God is weak, I can probably tell you it's because you haven't been reading the Bible recently. Or you've been reading it, but you haven't been paying attention. You've been reading it, but there's just been ink on the page. 
friend, don't let your faith weaken, but turn those promises into prayers. Third, Abraham did not think about his own natural weakness. Being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. Abraham didn't look at himself, he looked at God. Friend, for every one look you take at yourself, take ten looks at Jesus. Don't consider your own weakness, don't consider your own inability, consider Christ's strength, consider Christ's ability. Stop looking in the mirror and start looking in the Word. Don't limit God by your natural limitations. Listen, the truth is if you and I can do it, it's not worth doing. Let's not limit God by our natural limitations. As far as Abraham's physical body was concerned, as far as Abraham's natural ability was concerned, his opportunities to be a father were over and he knew it. Paul tells us there, halfway through verse 19, he was 100 years old. <laughs> now listen, I basically flunked out of high school biology, but even I know it's unlikely that you're going to give birth when you are that age. Abraham knew that too. Listen, we think of, of people in the Bible as these sort of ignorant ancients, but, but Abraham knew, he knew that. But he didn't consider his own body, he didn't consider Sarah's dead womb, he considered God, who is able. This is almost the storyline of the whole Bible, isn't it? The storyline of the whole Bible is Abraham and Sarah physically worn out giving birth. The storyline of the whole Bible is Noah building a boat in a desert because God told him to. The story of the whole Bible is David leaving his sheep and on the same day ending up fighting a giant without armour, just with a slingshot and ending up overcoming that giant. The story of the Bible is 11 men on a hillside in Galilee changing the world. The story of the Bible is God doing impossible things through unlikely people. People like you and me. If you look at yourself, you're going to get discouraged. If you look at God, there is no discouragement to be had. Don't look at your circumstances. Look at God. Next we see that Abraham did not stagger. Man, I love this. Verse 20. He staggered not with the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith giving glory to God. He staggered not. He wavered not. If you keep going back and forth between what God promises you and what you think the world promises you, you you'll always be weak. Like the false prophets of Baal, going back and forth between the God of the Bible and the, the idols that they worshipped. Elijah asks them, how long will you go on limping between two opinions? There's nothing more miserable than than a head full of Bible and a heart full of sin. Do not waver. Do not stagger. Stick with God. That's what saving faith does. Saving faith doesn't stagger. Saving faith doesn't, doesn't waver. Saving faith goes with God. Saving faith means that you are completely and utterly in God's hands and there you love to be and there you remain. Saving faith means even though the Lord Jesus calls you out into the wilderness, you don't listen to the voices of the world that claim to tell a better story, you stick with Jesus. Saving faith means it's never rained and you live in a desert and you're building a boat because God has told you to. Christian, don't waver, but stick with God. We're all really good at justifying our own reasons for things, aren't we? Well, maybe you're not. I, I really am. I'm, I'm great at that. I can, my mind can justify anything my heart wants. But so many of our excuses for taking a step back in our relationship with God, so many of our excuses for skipping church or ignoring the Bible, man, they sound great to us right now, but I'm not sure they'll sound all that good when we tell them to Jesus on that last day. Friend, don't waver, but stick with God. Number five, 
Paul tells us that Abraham gives glory to God. I just, I just love this. And listen, I've been chewing on this verse all year. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. So God promised him something outrageous. God promised him something huge. And Abraham said, I believe it. I'm sticking with it. I'm trusting it. Re regardless of evidence to the contrary, I'm sticking with God. He was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Abraham gave glory to God. Christian, this is why you exist. You exist to give glory to God. Listen. If you don't know why you're on planet Earth, you're always going to struggle. You're always going to be miserable. You're on planet Earth to give glory to God. So whatever situation you find yourself in, whatever circumstance you arrive in, give glory to God. You've been pushed on a stage. You barely know your lines. The light's on and there's no second act. Give glory to God. This is how he grew in his faith. You want to grow in your faith? Give glory to God. Do you want to give glory to God? Then grow in your faith. Trusting God gives glory to God. When my car's broken, I take it to a mechanic, and I, I give glory to that mechanic by trusting him with my car. Christian, when your life is broken, give it to God, and you give glory to God by trusting God with your life. Wake up every morning and thank God for what he's done and what he's doing, and what he will do. As you grow in your faith, you give glory to God. Because as you grow in your faith, you see more glorious things that God is doing. And as you give glory to God, you grow in your faith. It's a circle, right? We grow in our faith, giving glory to God. And as we give glory to God, we grow in our faith. We've got to train our hearts and our mind to look at God and be thankful. To look at God and give Him glory. Our faith is a muscle like any other. It needs to be worked out. Lastly, Abraham was fully persuaded that God's promise was not too hard for him. Verse 21, being fully, fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was also able to do. I wonder if you believe that about God. Or if sometimes you wonder and worry whether or not God hasn't overpromised and overstretched himself, overexerted himself. Really, verse 21 sums up what faith in the Christian life is supposed to look like, doesn't it? We all have seasons where we struggle to pray, struggle to give glory to God, struggle to live faithfully, struggle to trust in God, but we must work hard and pray hard to make sure that those seasons don't harden our hearts and that those seasons don't turn into a life filled with unbelief. We must trust in God and hope in God. Turn those promises into prayers. Look at God. Don't look at yourself. Don't waver. Don't stagger in unbelief. But instead, give glory to God. Don't look at your circumstances. Look at your God. Don't look at the wilderness that you, that you are walking through. Look at the promised land that you're coming to. How should we live if we're saved by faith? Let's live full-heartedly, wholeheartedly, with an ever-growing confidence in God and in God alone. Christians in this time, we ought to be more thankful than ever for objective, revealed, heavenly truth. Let's learn about and live for the God we meet in this book. Will you pray with me? Let's pray uh, as we wrap up. Father, you are so good to us and we pray that you would uh, continue to bless us, continue to encourage us, continue to help us. Uh, Lord, we do remember those this morning who are sick and, and struggling. Lord, we remember uh, Miss Lois and Miss Wendy pray for mighty acres. Lord, we ask that you would give strength and faith to those who need it. Lord, we look ahead to being together again on, on Sunday. And we ask that you would bring us here safely with hearts prepared to worship. Lord, thank you for this time. I pray that uh, the truth of your word might 
dig down deep into our hearts and produce fruit for your glory. Father, we love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Thank you for joining us this morning. We look forward to seeing you on Sunday. God bless.